Baker on Bloomberg Mondays, primetime, 6 o'clock. Thank you for joining us. And every single Monday, we bring you the movers, the shakers, the cultural scene of our lovely and wonderful, magical city of Miami. And with that said, I have the, a wonderful pioneer in politics, being the first uh, Latin mayor uh, uh, in an American city in 1973, Maurice Ferre, mayor of the city of Miami, and also continues in tendency in Tennessee for 12 years, six terms elected as the mayor in one of the worst but best times, one of the most interesting times for Miami as it goes from a Southern American, mostly Anglo, 98%, to now, as to the late 80s, becoming this whole influx of Venezuelans, Colombianos, Cuban refugees, Puerto Ricans, now everything turns around. The children become a educated. Asians, Jamaicans. Jamaicans, Haitians, Bahamians. Venezuelans, Argentines, and now a big flux of Brazilians. A big flux of but Brazilians. That happened a little bit later. That happened in the 90s. And by the way, you said 98% white. It wasn't because you forgot the black community. Oh, sorry. So, yeah. so yes, in other words, it was about 60% white. and 98% non-Hispanic is non what I should have said. That's, that's, that's the way I should have said it. And thank you for correcting me on that. But now, look at Miami and what's happened to Miami since the 80s, okay, mid-80s, all the way to 2005. I'm going to give it that decade, okay? Yeah. Now you see all this development yep. happening all over, square footage of South Beach going through the roof, now trickling over to the parts of Miami, right. where the design district, Wynwood, you know, ghost town areas are now becoming 1 billion, 1.4 billion by the developer Craig Robbins is injected injected into the new luxurious wow. Wow. design district. Craig, Craig Robbins is one of the great heroes of Miami. Tony Goodman, all, all, all the girls that you were involved with in, in, uh, in, in Miami Beach and then Wynwood. And then Wynwood. But that, that's been in the last 20 years. That's in the last 20 years. Now I'm seeing something interesting happening in Miami. <laughs> I, and I like to see the vision that you have for Miami in the next decade, because I see this. Well, you're going to like what I'm going to tell you. Okay, I think tell I, me. You, you know, I think the great big future of Miami has to do with culture. In other words, I think you hit it right on the head, Susanna. You're in the right place at the right time, also, for this reason. Yes, South Beach, but it's it's a lot more than South Beach. It's 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 the Miami City Ballet and the opera, and the Arst Center, and now the Paris, the PAM, the Paris Museum, and now this wonderful science museum that's coming on. That's going to be the, the science museum in the United States. Uh, there are others that will be larger, you know, New York, Chicago, and other places, but this is going to be the best. But we have something that is going to be the best, and you know why? Because with all the wonderful uh, collections and all the wonderful uh, cultural programs offered to visitors and residents of our city. And don't forget sports. And the sports. The heat, the, the dolphins, the marlins, I mean. The stadiums. They have their major, uh, the people come here to, 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 to see these, uh, these basketball games and these football and baseball. Uh, I mean, that draws people from the Dominican Republic, from Puerto Rico. They come from all over. All over. Absolutely. Now, I wanted to tell you, and, 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 and in agreement with you, is that Miami is becoming a cultural hub. And right. it's becoming Art, one of the most significant Art cities. Hello. Art Basel is super important. And I was speaking to one of the creative um, uh, pioneers behind it besides Norman Brayman was Robert Goodman yeah. and I spoke to Robert Goodman a few months ago and I wanted to ask him out of all the art Basels you know the, the originating city which is Basel Switzerland yeah. and then you have Hong Kong and then you have us which is the highest producing sales and he says hands down Miami absolutely and, and it isn't just an art Basel it's all the peripheral art shows that go on 
besides our basil, yes. which are just as important. All, this, yeah, all it, the satellite shows and yeah. pop-up shows that happen. It's it's in four days. Uh, it brings in 135,000 people, investors. It's a great injection uh, into the economy. And a lot of those investors have bought apartments, and then they bought two and three on an investment basis. Absolutely. And they made money on that. They flipped them, and they bought more. And it's caused all this, you know, this... The, this is just, it, it goes a domino effect. And the thing that you mentioned where, you know, New York and Boston and other areas might have a significantly maybe more important, but ours has something that no one else has. Yeah. The weather of course. and the water. And especially, especially in December, January, and February, when it gets very cold in Chicago and in Boston and in New York and in Cleveland and in Rochester and you name it. And people say, well, they, but they want to be in the USA, and they come to Miami, and the hotels have blossomed, and the restaurants are wonderful, and really Miami really has become Manhattan South. It Lawrence. has. It has. I absolutely. mean, for New Yorkers like you, you can, you can actually go out and trace the restaurateurs uh, who did very well in Studio 54, and, yeah. and they, you know, all of a sudden yeah. they become big, big, big players in the Miami sure. scene. Sure. Which is another interesting fact because I had gotten some emails of people not appreciating my uh, guess, but at the same token, you know, it, with the good. Comes, I hope it doesn't include me. No, not <laughs> you. Oh my gosh, no! Uh, you're an honor, distinguished guest. Okay. I'm talking. You're renowned. I'm talking about my infamous guest. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and I have to tell you that uh, even as uh, Washington D.C. steps in and and buys all these old warehouses in Wynwood yeah. to house the drugs and inventorize them, you know, in these huge warehouses, which the biggest warehouses, and due to the housing recession, the factories have moved out. And so here were these giant warehouses that Washington, D.C. can purchase and now make uh, all this, you know, oh. about the drug enforcement, uh, holding all the drugs and all the things that they captured, they would bring it into Wynwood. And now in the 90s, everything now is cleaned up. Everything has become back stable. And the New Yorkers come down in the late 80s, Absolutely. early 90s. And guess who buys these warehouses to put on their of large course, collections? Mara Rubel and Don Rubel buys a drug enforcement agency that used to right. warehouse all the drugs right in Wynwood on 36 and Northwest 2nd. They buy one of the biggest places, which now is a huge, which has been for the last oh, yeah. three decades, a wonderful and best then, contemporary and collection. Carlos and Rosa Cruz. Yes, and, then, and, and Marty Margulies in Wynwood with the big warehouses. Well, Marty Margulies is another one of our uh, heroes who came here. And uh, with nothing, and made a lot of money in real estate and Coconut development. Grove. And he developed some beautiful properties. Grove Isle. And he invested in art smartly. Yeah. And then he has one of the major art collections, Norman Brayman. You know, we, we have some major collectors of art in Miami. And Miami has really blossomed into a cosmopolitan city. But, but the interesting thing is... That, that the draw that Miami has is its charm and the weather and the, and the accessibility because uh, people complain about Miami International Airport. Hello, there are 40 million people that fly through Miami International yes. Airport How about the Port of year. Miami? And the Port of Miami has become the cruise capital of the world. World and soon to be the import-export yeah. capital. I mean, so, they are really... So there are a lot dreadful. of things that have blossomed out of these developments and and you, and you know why Susanna is because the the one thing that we can't screw up in Miami is that it's our ge our geography yes we're in the right place it absolutely and be, all the time yeah and the fact is that this is we're at the end of a peninsula that sticks out in the middle of the Caribbean and and, and, and the other thing that people don't understand is that everything in South America everything is east of Miami. Mm -hmm. People say, well, no. If I'm going from Los Angeles to Lima, Peru, I would just go down the west, the, the Pacific West Coast. No. If you're going from Los Angeles to Lima, you fly over Miami mm -hmm. because South America is not directly under North America. 
it's way off to the east. east that's right. See? Yeah. So so the Miami is really the pivotal point for for, for the and, rest and you of say, the well, Americas. You know, Latin America, who cares about Latin America? Well, hello, there are five hundred million people there. Well they're poor. Well they're not all poor. And things are changing. And things are changing. Absolutely. The I have to tell you, Brazil I see Brazil and, and Bogota, Colombia, and Lima, oh, Peru. Look at and, our universities. And, and look Santiago, at our international Chile. exchange students alone yeah. that are coming here right. from Colombia, from Venezuela, from South America, going for the MFAs and BFAs. And guess what? Many are going to stay and run some of these major uh, companies or their families. Uh, things are changing in Miami. And with the cultural wonderful injection of, the, of a world-class museum for a world-class city like yeah. the Perez Art Miami Museum and the, and the science, and now Norman Brayman, you mentioned. He's doing the Institute of Contemporary Art. 35,000 square feet, three floors, housing his and many contemporary collections right across from De La Cruz. And this is amazing. And now I'm seeing how all these collections are now bringing the people that would never have stepped here, that left, are now coming and buying. Isn't that so, wonderful? Isn't that amazing? And yeah. it's wonderful. So, and so, so, so Miami is taking a, a personality, a cultural, a cultural presence that is uniquely Miami. And now we even have we have Architectonica and others who have who have a Miami style, yes, and, you know. So that there, there's style. a Miami architectural style, and so and then you have these very smart investors like uh, uh, Arva Jane, mm -hmm. who came in here and saw the ability to buy properties. She's very astutely. She buys, sells, buys, sells, and then grows and grows and grows and ma major player. Like that, they're just a whole bunch of people. It isn't just Jorge Perez building. Yeah, building no, building. and you know what I love is the injection of art through our communities and public places. And Loria, Jeffrey Loria, who owns the Marlins. Yeah, yeah. People don't know that through that park, there are multi million dollars worth of well, art. Well, he's, he's an art dealer. He's, he's one major... of the biggest art collectors and dealers. In the first year in 2012, when the Marlins opens up, his annual salary that year was $39 million to his player. That year, he sold a Matisse for $32 million. I mean, this is a savvy art dealer yeah. who also loves sports, comes to Miami, creates this ballpark. I'm dying to see this season, what's going to happen. But the reason why I'm bringing this up is many people don't realize when you got that ballpark ticket and you're going to your seat, you're going over Carlos Cruz Diez, you're going over uh, a Moreau's. Hangs Borns, a three-story Kenny Sharp. I'm talking about some serious yeah, art absolutely. in our ballpark, absolutely. which is amazing. And that is so Miami now. Isn't that, that wonderful? Yes. I love it. I, I love what's happening, the resurgence. Uh, you know, I always, you know, with the art experience, which is my bread and butter, because this is all volunteered to bring in community leaders and cultural leaders and movers and shakers. But, you know... We, we don't get paid for this program. We actually support this program to wow. bring people and volunteer to bring amazing people. And I know, Maurice, you have to leave us now. But can, I, can you tell us on your newest project? Sure. Please tell yeah. our. Let's talk five minutes and then. then yes. Then, yes. Then I got to split. Okay, you okay. got it. And we Here. thank you again. Sure. An amazing, our first yeah. Latin, uh, an American city, 1973, 12 years, six term, uh, mayor. And uh, mayor, please continue, Maurice Ferre. Okay, so so here's here's a problem. How do we move people around such a spread out community? Because what's happened is Americans won't give up their automobiles. And so because of the, of the strong presence of automobiles, what's happened is instead of living within a community that you can walk or that you can ride that's five or ten miles, people now live in the 200 miles that go from here almost to central Florida which is a continuous city north of Palm Beach all the way down to Homestead. Now, it's called the Miami Metropolitan Area. I didn't put that name on it. The, the federal government did. That's what it's called. 
statistically it's the Miami metropolitan area. There's seven, six and a half million people. That makes that makes Miami the seventh largest community in the United States. Now we're not New York, Chicago, or Los Angeles, or Houston, but hello, we're up there. We're now number seventh, and we have, for example, the second largest. We have the second largest school system in the country. We have the largest community college. It has 120,000 students. Miami-Dade uh, College. Uh, Miami-Dade College is the largest community college in the United States of America. But just think of it, 120 there, there's 55,000 at FIU, there's 16,000 at the University of Miami. You add Barry and St. Thomas and the other and Florida Memorial, and you start adding all that together, and you're, you're talking about over 250,000 of the people of Miami that are going into some form of higher learning. So it's a major educational center. But the problem is, here's FIU. They want to now go from 55,000 to 65,000. How do they do that? Well, they, they don't have enough land for, for the buildings, and they don't have enough land for parking. So, well, there's no public transportation system. So we have to now start building transportation systems. Problem is that they're very, very expensive. Not only to build, but to operate. Trains, very expensive. So we have to figure alternative systems that, that how are we gonna do that with technology? So you ask me, what am I doing now? And here's where transportation is, is important in my life now, because I really, think that the major, the most important obstacle that the growth of Miami has is in solving our transportation problems. For example, here's a small, you know, detail, but it'll, it'll blow your mind. We have an obsolete light transit system. You know, these red lights that stop traffic? Yes. They don't communicate. They're not synchronized properly. Why? Because we bought yesterday's technology instead of tomorrow's technology. That cost $60 million, misspent. Mm -hmm. Now we have to go and correct it. How much is that going to cost? Hundreds of millions of dollars. Now you say, well, what's that have to do with traffic? If we had a synchronized light system in Miami-Dade County, and I've been saying this for 20 years, we would, we, we would increase throughput. In other words, people would go faster. 20%. Now, increasing of throughput decreases congestion. Absolutely. See, so we have to do things, we have to think of these things in an intelligent way. And the problem is that we're always fighting with each other in this community. That, that's another Very negative. Controversial. Everybody has an opinion. And, Everybody and, and, makes a task force. And where's the leadership? Right. Too many chefs with the same... That's yes. right. And there's too many... Well, you know, you promised me in the black community... Well, okay, that's true. And you broke your promise. Well, that's true. This community did break its promise. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, you have to build us the transit system. Well, but now, you know how much it costs to build one mile of metro rail? $240 million per mile. Now, we need to go up to the north part, which is the promise that was made, 10 miles. That's going to cost $2.4 billion. Well, who's going to pay for it? Fed? The feds? No, no. There's no more federal money. Not it's with the very, Republicans and the Democrats fighting in Washington. It's a very interesting uh, dilemma. So we have and to find solutions. I think some of these solutions are going to be passed on to the developers because as they want to build bigger buildings like Brickle Center, like World Center, they're going Somebody to have to, to be part absolutely. of the, the solution. The solution has to fall on that yeah, buck. Absolutely. So with that being said... I am waiting to bring you back on the show sure. in a couple of months to hear the progress <laughs> because if anyone yeah. is a mover and shaker to this town in 73 and all the way to today and in the future Thank is you. Maurice Ferre. And you, I'm Susanna. so thankful for you being on the show. Happy Thank you so it. much. And congratulations to you. Thank you so much okay. also. Bye -bye. So we're going to continue on our talk just to let you know.